Hey, my name's Tom and welcome back to Low Carbon Lifestyle. In the conversation about sustainability in the UK, it doesn't take long before you hear the word hydrogen, sometimes done with a knowing smile. Hydrogen. Or a chuckle. <laughs> hydrogen. Or a raised eyebrow. Hydrogen. But it's part of the conversation. We even see mention of green hydrogen in the media or by politicians wanting to emphasise their green credentials. And sometimes we talk about hydrogen as a magic fuel here to solve all our problems. But what problems should hydrogen solve? What can it solve? In this video, I'm gonna focus on heat and how hydrogen should be used in our heating systems. My name is Tom, and this is a little series about a low carbon lifestyle. This YouTube series is something I work at in my spare time, trying to share thinking about how we might all reduce emissions at home and in our lives more generally. But I also work full time in trying to reduce emissions in the region that I live, working on projects to remove gas boilers, to reduce the amount of electricity we use and to reduce the amount of fuel used in vehicles. The big challenge for us as a society is emissions linked to heat. So here is the second episode focused on the decarbonisation of heat, where, gonna, where I'm going to be thinking about the potential of hydrogen to provide heat. And I'll be asking the question, should we be installing hydrogen ready boilers? I mean, there are already proposals and trials to use hydrogen for heating in the UK, whether that's as a blend with natural gas in our existing pipework, with existing boilers and existing hubs, or it's in its purest form, 100% hydrogen gas delivered to your front door in a refurbished gas network, burnt in hydrogen boilers right in your home. Or actually there's even thinking around hydrogen supplied to, at a community level to fuel cells that will generate heat and power, heat and electricity to power the whole neighborhood cleanly. On the surface, each proposal makes sense. Replace a high carbon fossil fuel like natural gas with a zero carbon fuel like hydrogen, minimize the disruption and Bob is your uncle. Well, I'm sorry to say it's not that simple. Let's start with a hydrogen blend. Again, on the surface, you could think that a 20% blend would be a good thing. A 20% a 20 drop in emissions for heat is the kind of step change that we need to see in the short term. Let's start by assuming that the hydrogen we're blending is carbon free. Would a blend be a good step? Well, there is an issue with hydrogen that we need to go back to our chemistry textbooks to understand. When we replace 20% of the volume of natural gas with hydrogen, we actually reduce the amount of energy in the gas. Why is that? Well, in every meter cubed of methane, we get around 40 megajoules of energy. That, when we burn it, it gives off around 36 megajoules or 10 kilowatt hours of heat. Every meter cubed of hydrogen contains a bit less energy, actually around 13 megajoules. So when we burn a meter cubed of this new blended methane hydrogen mix in a gas boiler of the same efficiency, we put in 34.6 megajoules and we get out 31.1 megajoules or 8.67 kilowatt hours. A 20% blend gives out 14% less energy or would need 14% more gas to give out the same heat. That means bills could go up by another 14%, and that's for a 20% drop in emissions. Well, actually not quite, because we're assuming that there's no emissions associated with the hydrogen supply, which is actually a massive assumption that we'll come back to later. But let's stick with that for now. But because we need to burn more volume, the 20% reduction is actually more like 7.5%. So 14, maybe 15% extra for bills for a 7.5% 7 drop in emissions. And that's okay, but it's not great. We need that kind of emissions reduction every year to meet our obligations, to reduce our emissions by half by 2030. Okay, so a blend is a small step. What about the whole hog? 100% hydrogen coming down our pipes. Well, great. This could be a very low carbon source of hydrogen if the hydrogen is del delivered to us is from a low carbon source. And again, we'll come back to that later. But there are issues with using pure hydrogen in the same way that we use natural gas today. And again, back to the chemistry textbooks. Hydrogen comes to us in a little pair of hydrogen atoms, H2. This is the smallest molecule that we have. 
Because it's so small, it's actually quite difficult to store. Methane is CH4, a carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms. It's physically much bigger. Our current natural gas system is today prone to leak methane. That's why we have those smell gas, call this number signs, all around our towns and all around our cities. Hydrogen is even more prone to leak. Maybe in pipe joints, maybe through the pipe material itself. Maybe as it comes into a home, maybe it's stored for distribution, maybe as it's manufactured, maybe as we burn it in a boiler or on a hob. And why is that an issue? Well, like methane and like CO2, hydrogen in the atmosphere has a global warming potential. If we generate lots of this new fuel and even a small proportion of it leaks, then we still have problems. But maybe let's dream a little bit. Maybe we can plug the leaks. Are we okay to burn hydrogen then? Are we okay to use it in a fuel cell? Well, yeah, there may be a place for hydrogen boilers, for hubs or fuel cells delivering energy to our buildings. But I'm still pretty cautious about it. Why is that? Well, it simply comes down to the source of hydrogen, the processes that we need to use to make it, the quantities that we need, and the impact on our wider system. So where does hydrogen come from? We don't tend to find it lying about naturally like we do with fossil fuels. So we need to derive it from other molecules that contain it. The two molecules I'm gonna focus on here are water, high quality H2O. High quality H2O and methane, that natural gas that we already know so much about. So let's start with water. If we can split the hydrogen, the H2, and the oxygen, the O, in water, then we're onto a winner. And we can, using a process called electrolysis, we can draw those molecules apart with the product being pure oxygen and pure hydrogen. Electrolyzers are a fairly proven technology and we have big companies manufacturing electrolyzers in the UK, companies like ITM Power, and they'll they will definitely be part of our energy system in the coming decades. So this is great. We can use a bit of electricity and get really low carbon fuel out. But how much electricity and where does the electricity come from? And how much fuel can we produce in electrolyzers? As part of that again, we'll come back to it. We do have another option of making hydrogen and that's deriving it from natural gas. And we can do this through a, a few different processes. And my understanding, and I'm no chemical engineer, I'm a mechanical engineer, is that the most common process for making hydrogen uh, from natural gas is steam reformation. In steam reformation, we're adding methane to, a, to water and a bit of heat, and we get hydrogen out. And unfortunately, we also get CO2 as a byproduct. And so this is how most hydrogen we use today, and we do use some, more on that later as well, is how most of it is manufactured today. And it's actually a really high carbon process. The CO2 that's released in this process usually is just exhausted to atmosphere. And on top of that, the process is energy intensive in itself, using fossil fuels to generate heat needed to get the hydrogen. But we do have plans to capture the CO2 that is exhausted in this process. We could capture it and use it or capture it and store it underground. We could maybe even store it in the North Sea in the oil and gas fields that we have mined over the last several decades. And this is great. But let's be honest, we're a long way away from having a functioning carbon capture system that would operate alongside hydrogen production. And I'm concerned that we risk starting an industry that could still have leaks. Even if 1% of the CO2 captured was, did leak, then we still have problems with emissions that need to be less than zero. And then actually in the contents, context of the current energy price crisis, I would ask how much hydrogen fuel made in this way is gonna cost. We're taking a fuel that we currently use and a fuel that has over the last year tripled in costs, natural gas. We're putting it through a process that needs additional energy and then we're adding on a whole new industry that isn't even in place yet to make it low carbon. The cost of hydrogen that carries less energy than natural gas will be higher than the gas used to make it. If we're reliant on this fuel for heating, we risk locking in really high prices for good. But anyway, I'm being such a pessimist here. I've actually outlined how we could have two sources of very low carbon hydrogen, electrolysis and through steam reformation with carbon capture, which is fantastic. And now we can burn it in boilers. Well, maybe. 
The story of green hydrogen manufactured using electrolyzers is that it could use zero carbon renewable electricity to make it. Great. The wind blows, the sun shines, and we generate a fuel that we can store, we can transport, and we can use in a variety of ways. But the question is, is this a good use of the electricity? Well, let's do the maths. One of those electrolyzers from ITM Power, a UK-based manufacturer, would use five megawatts of electricity to make 90 kilograms of hydrogen per hour. Five megawatt hours for 90 kilograms. 90 kilograms would be about the equivalent of three megawatt hours of energy. So that's an efficiency of 60%. So that renewable energy is now worth 60% of what it was as a green electron. We would then need to transport the hydrogen in pipes or in tankers. And let's assume this doesn't lose much of that hydrogen that we've produced. So it delivers 95% of the energy that we had to where it's needed. We then put it through a boiler that's at best 95% efficient. We're now at about 54% of the energy we had in the electricity grid from those renewable, that renewable power in the first place. So I'm not sure this is the best use of electricity, particularly when we're focused on heat. If we use this green electricity to heat via heat pumps, then we start to have a massive gap in efficiency. The renewable electricity from a wind turbine or a solar panel would lose some energy in transmission losses, but it would then be used to power a heat pump that is at least 250% efficient. This means we are delivering heat from renewable sources and getting more than four times the amount of heat out than if we burnt hydrogen and hydrogen made through electrolysis. And this in turn means we would need at least four times more renewable energy capacity, which is a challenge to build in itself. So when we have a much more efficient alternative for heating, we need to ask, is burning hydrogen in a boiler the right use of low carbon hydrogen? And if not, what is the right use of, new, of this new, clean, precious fuel? Are there uses of low carbon hydrogen that we don't have many other options to decarbonize? Are there uses for low carbon hydrogen that we do have other good options to decarbonize? If so, maybe hydrogen could be cheaper. Well, let's start down that rabbit hole. We actually already use hydrogen in industry, industries like fertilizer production, and actually in processing hydrocarbons. There are some industries therefore that need a low carbon source of hydrogen, and we should start here. Globally, we currently use over 90 million tonnes of hydrogen each year. Hydrogen that's mainly manufactured, mainly generated in a high emissions way, emitting over 800 million tonnes of CO2. For context, 800 million tonnes of CO2 is about 2% of global emissions already manufacturing hydrogen. And that's a similar ballpark to the whole aviation industry. Not so clean a fuel, I guess. But remember that five megawatt electrolyzer that generates 90 kilograms per hour? Well, running at full pelt, it would generate 788 tons per year. So the world would need 114,000 ITM power electrolyzers with over 570 gigawatts worth of capacity to meet the, the global demand for hydrogen today. That's the equivalent of 10 times the UK electricity grid capacity today. And the plan for the UK is 10 gigawatts of electrolyzer capacity by 2030. So generating low carbon hydrogen to replace high, high emissions hydrogen is a great place to start and there's a, already a huge demand today. Next, there are other industries that don't currently use hydrogen but could, but use a fossil fuel to generate loads of heat or loads of energy to power a process. And these high emission fossil fuels could potentially be replaced by low carbon hydrogen to do a similar job. And there are moves to use hydrogen in industries like manufacturing steel that's currently reliant on coking coal. And next, there is a whole range of industries that currently use fossil fuels in everyday processes. Shipping, maybe aviation, maybe big road vehicles. Michael Liebreich, the commentator, engineer, investor, lots of different things. He's put together a hydrogen ladder of where low, low carbon hydrogen should be used first. The cases near the top of the ladder don't really have a low carbon alternative and at the bottom do have a low carbon alternative that is likely to be cheaper, more efficient and lower emissions. So where does using hydrogen for heating come in Michael Liebreich's ladder? Well, it comes near the bottom 
And why is that? Well, it's, for, it's really for the reasons that I've outlined already. There's already an alternative to heating by hydrogen that is a much more efficient use of energy. And hydrogen will be such a precious resource that we need it all across our economy in much more difficult to, areas to decarbonize. This is actually the same story for private four-wheeled hydrogen vehicles. There is already an alternative that is efficient, clean, and already has a success story. And it's already outcompeted hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. The challenge is so big. The use of hydrogen is so precious, it will be inappropriate to use it for something we already have a better solution for. So my conclusion is that we shouldn't be using any hydrogen for heating. We shouldn't use it as a blend or as 100% fuel in a boiler or via a fuel cell. Why is that? Because the, the cost is likely to be high, because there are risks linked to the emissions in the system to make it, because there are many more important places to use it and because the demand for low carbon hydrogen is already massive. And actually, because we already have a technology that is already much more efficient, much lower carbon and able to be installed tomorrow. There is a lot of noise in the hydrogen world and there are a lot of misleading statements about hydrogen could be used. There are a lot of lobbyists in Westminster trying to ensure hydrogen is a big part of a low carbon future. And it should be, but we should be very cautious when we see campaigns associated with hydrogen for heating. We should understand where these campaigns are coming from and we should ask whether the interests of all of us are what's driving them. Interests that include keeping costs low, security of supply, and most importantly, responding to the climate emergency. If even a hint of the interests behind hydrogen for heat campaigns are about prolonging fossil fuel infrastructure and blue hydrogen would do exactly that, then we need to be really cautious. I hope all that makes sense to you. I've worked out a lot of this content in this video myself from first principles of the chemical properties of fuels, from data sheets, from manufacturers um, literature. But I've also drawn upon the perspective from Michael Liebreich, who's really leading the way in calling out some of this stuff. And I've looked at research from people like Jan Rosenau. There is a lot out there that will help us navigate this hydrogen, this murky hydrogen world. Don't take my word for it. Do the math yourself. Do the reading yourself. This video about hydrogen was the second video about, uh, about the options that we have for decarbonising heat in the UK. The first one was looking at district heating and you can watch it up here. The next one will be about how I think we should be focusing our efforts. Thanks for watching.